Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to play a Souls-like, but as a crab? Well, this game is for you. This ain't your typical Souls-like. Forget the Knights of the Sun and your tarnished armor. Here, you play as Krill, a hermit crab who fashions his defenses from the ocean's trash. From cans of soda to banana peels and even a shot glass, anything goes in quest to retrieve your home. Another crab's treasure first emerged from the deep in 2022's Nintendo Indie World, and it's been snapping at my attention ever since. Developed by AgroCrab and released for Nintendo Switch, PlayStation 5, Xbox, and the PC, this game throws a crab-tastic twist on the Souls-like genre with its unique shell system. But wait, there's more. The developers promised a rich underwater world teeming with secrets just waiting to be explored. Buckle up, because we're diving deep into spoiler territory for another crab's treasure. Skip to this timestamp to avoid spoilers. You have been warned. What word comes to mind when you think of the Earth? For some, that word might be beautiful. Others might say the world is hateful or evil or unstable or full of shit. But above all else, the word that best describes our world is resilient. Against the odds, time and time again, creatures adapt to make the most of their given environment. Some learn to feed on others, stealing their vitality for their own. Some become scavengers, living off what strangers leave behind. And others still, as we will soon see, would prefer to be simply left alone. Our story begins with a brief monologue about the Earth and its resilient creatures, showing us various forms of marine wildlife and slowly transitions to a tide pool where our hero Krill is living. Krill gets a visit from a lone shark is informed that the tide pool he is living in is being annexed by the duchy of Slack Tide. Sir, are you the owner of this residence? You mean my shell? Uh, yeah, it's mine. Do you like it? I represent the royal duchy of Slack Tide, which has recently annexed the territory surrounding and including this tide pool. I'm here to inform you that you have outstanding taxes that date back and upwards of 10 tides. Uh, Krill, bless his coolest heart, he is a hermit crab after all, tries everything to pay off the taxes he apparently owes. He offers heart pods, pleads for an extension, but the loan shark doesn't budge. Turns out, Krill's been living rent-free for way too long, and now it's time to pay the piper. And someone's leaving with a shell one way or another. <laughs> Krill then decides to follow the lone shark into the open ocean. Seeing the harsh world where crustaceans and sea creatures attack him, he picks up a fork and a plastic bandana as he continues his chase for the lone shark. Krill then finds himself at Castle Slacktide, informed by the guards that he must find a shell in order for him to have an audience with the Duchess. Krill then makes his way towards the captain of Fort Slacktide in order to procure a shell. He looks around but doesn't see anyone and activates a vending machine that spews out multiple cans. Flow south, lawbreaker! Oh crab, I'm sorry. Was I supposed to grab a ticket? You think yourself above the law, but the law is not so easily outwitted. By its strength alone, do we rise above the beasts? I'm really sorry. I'll go to the back of the line, okay? <laughs> you should be so lucky. I'll have your head like I have these other worthless lower breakers. He's then faced with Captain Nephro, a lobster knight who cannot be reasoned with and has to fight the captain. This will be your first story-based boss fight. The captain will have charging attacks, he will use his wide slashes and even has an unblockable move where he will drag Krill along the sand dealing a major damage. We'll talk about more of these mechanics later on in the video. Back to the story. 
After showing the guards at the castle that you have a shell and they let you through and you luckily have a walk-in audience with the Duchess Magista who tasks you with collecting treasure in order to get your shell back. You make your way to a nearby cave and fight the crab guarding the treasure which is a shiny and lustrous pearl. The fight with this polluted crab is a bit easy as it mainly uses heavy strikes with this Ramene bottle. After defeating the crab and collecting the treasure, you journey back to the castle only to find out that the Duchess and her entire kingdom have succumbed to a mysterious ailment. Hey, I don't know if you noticed, but your guards are going nuts out there! Oh, Clontre, little hermit. <laughs> Our minds are clear as crystal now. Oh, Shuck. I once thought my duchy quite beautiful, you know. Worth preserving. But compared to the reefs, it's a shameful, transient thing, destined to wash away. That's why I'm having them tear it down. I thought my beauty worth preserving too. But of course, my worthless life will wash away as easily as any other. Almost as easily as your little hermit! <laughs> You then fight off with the Duchess Magista. Her boss fight is a bit hard if you're not ready and do not have her patterns down. I managed to beat her by spamming some skills and blocking attacks, then attacking her when she has her downtime. Design-wise, Magista is wearing a crown that says 30. I totally wonder whose birthday that crown was from. Unless it's a 30 going 30 reference, then I don't know where it's from. After defeating Magista, the Lone Shark reappears and tells you that he'll be heading to New Crescinia and sells your shell there. You make your way to the big city, New Crescinia. New Crescinia has two areas, the upper crust where most of the rich marine life live while in the lower crust is where poor marine life are. It's a bottom siders versus top siders world. New Crescinia also draws parallels to Piltover and Zaun from League of Legends where people in Piltover have it good while people in Zaun suffer while trying to get fresh air or similarly the city of Bellabog in Hawkeye Star Rail where the people from the underground are also living in a worse state than those living in the main city. You then meet a fellow hermit crab named Firth, who by the way is voiced by my favorite YouTuber Michael Reeves. Be free! <laughs> Firth is an enterprising hermit crab who'll do anything to make it big in the ocean. This guy is looking for his next get rich quick moment. You meet Nemma, the owner of a tavern called the Bottom Feeders, quite self-deprecating in my opinion. And another important character you can meet in New Crescinia is the museum head, Conch, the Hermit Crab. Krill wanders around the city some more until he runs across a creature the Lone Shark sold his shell to, Pronathan. Not gonna lie, Pronathan owning a pawn shop is pure comedic genius. After trying to buy his shell back from Pronathan and Pronathan not budging an inch, Krill ponders on what's going to happen next trash begins to rain on the city. You can see residents scrambling to collect trash as trash is considered currency in the ocean. A cereal box then falls into the middle of New Carcinia and the residents take it as a sign from the lobster god. Conch says that it's a map, a map that leads to treasure. A map specifically designed to show you treasure. A treasure map. You then meet the obvious villains of the game, Roland the Isopod and his right hand squid, Inkerton. Is it Isopod Hour yet? It's Isopod Hour! To the dance! Roland says that they'd be the ones taking the treasure. Jonathan then proposes to Krill that if he can get the treasure, then he gets his shell back. Krill sticks it up to the man and says he'll be the one getting the treasure, which also lifts up the spirits of the residents into partaking in the treasure hunt. Conch will then provide you some information on where the first map piece can be found. Conch tells you that you must head over to the Enchanted Grove and not get devoured on the way. This is an important warning as you cross the sands between, which is clearly a reference to Elden Ring. Shout out Elden Ring. A creature named Pagurus the Ravenous wanders the sands between in search of prey. Pagurus looks really scary, but we'll talk about him later. Paths have been created to avoid Pagurus. If ever he does show up when you stray from the path, once you go near a life boy, he then goes back to search for other prey. 
After making your way through the sands between, you meet up with Kaiden, the lobster guard from Castle Slactide, and explains to you the phenomenon that is taking over the creatures under the sea, which is called the gunk, which is basically poisoning their minds and their bodies. You then enter the enchanted grove, but since it has been taken over by the gunk, it's now called the expired grove. You find your way in the area, and you are met with a boss fight before you can get through to the next area you're supposed to be in. After fighting through the grove, you are then met with the holder of the first map, Helkia, the Intimidation Crab. The fight with Helkia is going to be a little rough as he'll be using one unbroken chopstick and attack you with a mix of heavy and light strikes. These strikes are telegraphed and can be easily dodged and if you're on a pinch, well, you're fighting him on a sushi plate. You can use some sushi rolls to restore your HP and after hitting a certain threshold, Helkia will then break the chopsticks into two and will now attack more ferociously. Since you've already got a read on his attacks, you'll notice the telegraphed additional attack he makes. Parrying and blocking during this fight will make it trivial and being able to time your dodge also helps. Using your fishing line also makes it easier to swap shells mid-fight so you can heal if you run out of hard pods. After defeating Helkia, you can then teleport back to New Carcinia to deliver the piece of the map. You are then told to run towards the Floatsome Vale. Uh, the Floatsome Vale is essentially a trash pile. Before fully being able to go inside the Vale, Inkerton shows up. Inkerton is ready to fight, as he has what I think are a pair of pliers. Inkerton does a lot of damage, however, you don't have to fully fight him, you just have to drop him to a certain amount of HP and he'll then retreat. You'll now have to navigate the convoluted area of the Floatsum Vale. After finding your way through the hordes of enemies and areas you'd potentially get lost in, you find Firth standing on top of the entrance of a pipe, which you'll have to traverse in to reach the mailbox in the Vale. Once you make it deep enough in the pipes, you have to fight the Ceviche sisters. They're a tough duo to fight as they are both ranged fighters and will hit hard. They are a bit frail though, so being able to drop the first sister makes the whole fight a lot easier. As long as you don't get caught between a crossfire with the both of them, you can easily maneuver the fight. They have similar moves with the overworld shrimp mob and if you've been running around the veil for a while, you're quite used to the time frame these shrimps shoot. After defeating the Ceviche sisters, you then get to the top of the Vale and claim your second piece of the map. You return to New Carcinia and get more information from Conch on the whereabouts of the final piece of the map. Conch then tells you that you're in for a rough time because you're about to fight Pagurus the Ravenous for that final piece. Pagurus' design is scary as heck. It has a knife and a fork rope to its pincers. Pagurus will use swift swiping attacks and a mix of heavy smashes, and if you get caught by Pagurus' unblockable attack and your HP is not looking too good, well, someone's getting turned into crap food. Pagurus also frightens Krill when it uses its roar. However, when Pagurus reaches half of its HP bar, it will also use a roar with a sandworm popping out of its eye patch. I'm not gonna lie, that is a freaky sight. Once you figure out the method to the madness of Pagurus, and defeat it, you then get the final piece of the map and bring it back to Kaj. After arriving back to New Carcinia and completing the map, which is a basic puzzle on the back of the cereal box and learning about the whereabouts of the treasure, Roland then takes the box away and starts to make his way to the treasure across the Lake of Gum. As the townsfolk lament the thought that Roland gets the treasure as he has the only boat that's able to traverse the lake, the townsfolk hatch a plan to catch up by finding their own vessel that allows them to follow Roland. You then go back to the Vale and find a way to power up the boat they've prepared. Firth and Krill travel through the junkyard fighting through hordes of gunked up enemies and solving magnetic puzzles where you must find a fuse plug to activate certain platforms or remove the magnet so you can travel around the area. During my time playing in this area, I felt a bit lost or I felt like I didn't know what to do as the area is huge and you don't get a lot of indicators on where some stuff are located. Especially if you decide to jump a random area like me, so I guess a rule of thumb is not to jump around and skip places if you don't know the layout. After a while of going back and forth and trying to find out what I did wrong, you then get to fight Volte, the accumulator. The world these days is dark and mean. Even the water tastes unclean. And even those you love and trust would rip your limbs off if they must. Like Mr. R, the one in charge, who scrapped our homes to build his barge. 
But don't be gloomy, glum, or sad. Cause down in here, it's not so bad. Save crying for another day. Forget it all. Come on, let's play. So, Volte is a pleasant surprise as most enemies and bosses are crabs, lobsters, and other crustaceans. Volte is an electric eel. She'll be moving around the arena and will be using a few different appliances she can power on. She'll be using these four appliances to fight. A toaster, a Wi-Fi extender, a hair dryer, and she'll also attack you with Fuzzly's guitar. What's that under your bed? Uh, probably a, uh, a uh, guitar? The fight is very easy to be honest. Once you find the rubber band stowaway, all of her damage goes away. And all you need to do now is just hammer her HP down. The fight will take some time though, because she'll be traveling between the appliances. Nonetheless, it is an easy smackdown. Thanks for playing with me. After defeating Volte, you now have to go back to the boat and power it up. You'll have a short cutscene where everyone talks about what they would do if they get the treasure. Krill then says he is not willing to share the treasure with the group and that he'll trade the treasure in to get his shell back. Krill then gets some backlash and is tagged selfish by the townsfolk. I mean, he is a little selfish if you get what I mean. Krill is then asked why that shell is special and he just can't explain and it leaves it at that. Krill and the gang then catch up to Roland and make their way to a pinball machine. Roland has set up a trap and decides to deal with Krill and the townsfolk of New Crescinia. He orders Inkerton to attack but is intercepted by Chitin and Roland decides to get his hands dirty and fight Krill himself. Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. No one even showed up to stop us. I don't like it. Something smells about all this. Roland knew we were gonna show up, so where's all the resistance? It all really stinks of- A trap? Right you are, bottom feeder. See, us civilized folk have rules. As much as I dislike your little mottled crew, it wouldn't be gentlemanlike to have you disposed of without a good reason. But all y'all have just stepped onto my private property without permission. And where I come from, that's a crime called trespassing. I presume you know what we do to trespassers at Shellfish Corp. Inkerton, kill the city folk. Gladly. <laughs> and as for you... The fight with Roland is fun yet frustrating. Roland deals a lot of damage and attacks you with a hex wrench. He will have a mix of heavy and light attacks and will also have some pauses while attacking, which can trick you into dropping your guard and eating up lead. You can pick up gotcha capsules and use them to ram into Roland. After doing a certain amount of damage, Roland begins to roll out himself and you'll need to dodge it as a blocking will result in major damage to the shell you're using. After defeating Roland, his bicycle crane then finds a treasure and he starts to berate the people of New Carcinia. Krill is fed up and says that he deserves to get the treasure because he worked hardest for it. He then makes a lunge at Roland which tilts the pinball machine and has everyone fall into the abyss. We then get treated to a short cutscene of Krill's life. In my opinion, this looks like Krill just had his entire life flash before him. You then wake up in the end fathom. You wander around and see nothing but darkness. It's over. It's all over. But like, for real this time. There you are! Do you know what happened to the others? Oh, now you care about the others, is that right? They can get boiled for all I care, and as a matter of fact, so can you! Take a look, pal. Here's the treasure you had us throw our lives away for. <sighs> What's that? It's nothing! Nothing usable at all! No plastic, no glass, not even a single nugget of foam. Just this pile of damp paper. It's totally worthless. It was really all for nothing? So, so what do we do now? You want my advice? Go find whatever the apex predator is down here and jump in their goddamn mouth! Then you'll finally be valuable to someone! 
you meet Firth, and Firth begins to blame you for whatever happened. The treasure was actually no use for the residents of New Crescinia, as it is just wet paper. In the human world, yes, that is literally a buttload of cash. Hundred dollar bills and wads in a treasure chest. And that is treasure for us. But in the ocean world, foam, plastics, and cans are considered treasure. If you don't fight, you will die like prey, along with the rest of this world. Maybe I don't care. A voice then continues to pester Krill with thoughts of nihilism, thoughts of destruction, thoughts of rage, and that throws Krill into a spiral of self-doubt, pain, and depression. He was ready to throw away his life to be consumed by the darkness. The Unfathom is basically rock bottom. This isn't your average everyday darkness. This is advanced darkness. The entirety of the Unfathom is dark as hell, and you must find your way back towards the pinball machine. I had a hard time navigating the Unfathom because in darkness, almost everything looks the same. Uh, the area is littered with enemies, and I do have a, some sort of thalassophobia, and the darkness is unsettling. There's even jump scares in this section, such as anglers posing as collectible items, and if you're not careful enough, your angler chow. After doing a couple of rounds in the Unfathom, I realized that things that are scattered around the Unfathom are glow sticks. You have to smack them to activate them. This made finding my way around the area a whole lot easier. After scattering the area, you then notice an umami current, which is a fast travel spot and a checkpoint. You make your way across the Unfathom and try to go inside the moon snail shell. You thought it was a safe haven, but bam, it's a boss fight. This will really catch you unprepared as you have fought through a bunch of enemies before even reaching that point. Petrock, the false moon, is a challenging boss fight. Petrock will have a bunch of offensive and defensive moves to fight you. Petrock can create crystals and do major damage that way, or use its shell and roll over you which can lead to easily breaking your shell, or it can even parry your attacks. Petrock also lunges at you and does a whole lot of damage that way. Figuring out its pattern is the best way to beat it, but if you're like me, I did blocking and attacking, or just using shell hammers to do tons of damage. After defeating Petrock, you get a chance to travel to New Crescinia to resupply, upgrade, and do a whole lot more. Kaj will continue the journey with you as he mentions that the area you're going through seems to be the road to an ancient city that holds an ancient artifact that can change the world. Krill then takes this as renewed hope that he can use that artifact and exchange it for his shell. Once you're prepared enough and are ready to continue your adventure, you can then make your way towards the Abyssal Plains. The Abyssal Plains is a pain in the ass. The area is filled with enemies and these giant-ass spider crabs that have a telephone attached to its head and blast lasers through its eyes that explode. Traversing the Abyssal Plains is hard as you'll be evading laser blasts that make annoying sounds, the squids and anglerfishes are still in the area, and the main obstacle are the spider crabs because they do major damage and can easily break your shell. Once you find your way around, you meet up with Kitan towards the end of the Abyssal Plains. You then see Inkerton and Roland arguing, and Roland then says that he should have left Inkerton for dead. Inkerton, now succumbing to the gunk, decides that he's gonna shoot Roland and end his life right there. Inkerton now turns his attention to you and will now finish that fight you had in the Floatsome Vale. The fight with Inkerton is hard as Inkerton can move freely around and smack you with the players he has. He can shoot you with a party popper gun or use his ink to hide from you and surprise attack you if you're not careful. Defeating Inkerton is a challenge if you're unprepared. Constant tells you that the road you're going through next is the old ocean. He then explains that he was born there and it has been a while since he's been in the area. You find your way around the old ocean and see resident crabs who when you defeat them molt out of their shells and fight you a second time. The area is pretty chill and there aren't a lot of enemies to be worried about until you reach a bridge. This then leads you to the old kingdom of Cursidia. In my opinion, this is such a great move by the devs because it's basically a parallel to the beginning and the end of the game. Both have castles and monarchs who succumb to their greed, and Conch drops tidbits of information about the ruler of old Crescinia. The kingdom area is wild, and I can tell you seeing a lobster get wings using a maxi pad is not something I had on my 2024 bingo card. The castle has timed puzzles and moving platforms. I really love this mix-up as it truly gives off that I'm about to face a tough challenge and it's testing my skills. 
Titan also tells you that one day you will have to fight as they will want to use the artifact to their own benefit. Once you've traveled deeper inside the ruins, you then see the throne room. You then learn that the old King Kamsha was greedy and wanted the power of the hermit crabs to himself. He is the catalyst for the destruction of the kingdom. His obsession with trash unleashed the gunk into the world. You then face off with the still living bleached crab king, which is Kamcha. Kamcha, the bleached king, is a fun and challenging fight. He will attack you with his claws in a sweeping fashion and also use his royal scepter, which is a toilet scrubber. Now that you mention it, Kamcha's throne is a toilet seat. A fun move by the devs, I would say. All you have to do now is avoid his attacks and not get bleached, which affects your umami powers. After defeating his first stage, Kamsha molts out of his shell and fights you. I'm not gonna lie, I wanna eat Kamsha, but this guy just takes it to the next level. He wears fake teeth, and never have I thought a crab with human teeth would look so repulsive. The fight with Kamsha intensifies here. He'll have a lot of attacks that need dodging. He will jump and cause shockwaves that move the tiles around the room. He'll also use his multiple leg attack in a reckless manner, and this will do a lot of damage to your shell if you fail a dodge. Kamcha will also have an unblockable attack where he will grab you and bite you with the teeth he equips. An absolutely scary death, but I'd say Pigurus had a more scary unblockable. After defeating Kamcha, you can then take the toilet seat into the bottom of the drain. It is a rather peaceful walk as you slowly inch towards the ancient relic Kamcha has been talking about, the perfect world. This shell grants its wearer's godlike powers, enough to change the ocean. Conch then slowly makes his way to the perfect world, but is stabbed by a gunked up chitin. You try to reason with chitin on why they stab Conch, but Krill notices that chitin is being controlled by something. Krill feels that it's the same entity that was talking to him the entire time. The same entity that made him feel all of those negative emotions. The collective souls of the ocean that have fallen to pollution, and the gunk. Priodubia. Dubia, the ocean's agony, is the siphonophore and is the source of the gunk that's scattered all over the ocean. Priodubia then tells Krill that they've been trying to corrupt him so that he can become their vessel, or shell, and use the perfect world to end the world. Krill though is very stubborn for a character. He just has a few things on his mind. His shell, and the goal of getting it back from Pranathan, and his newly discovered affection for his friends from New Crescinia. You then have to fight Chitin that's being puppeteered by Priodubia. The fight is challenging as you'll have to deal with hordes of reanimated crab husks that attack you that deal a lot of damage. Chitin will also do slashing attacks. The fight is pretty much your boss summons a horde of enemies type of situation, then you can fight them again. I'm not gonna lie, it does feel a little anticlimactic as the game does hype up the potential glorious battle between the crustaceans Krill and Chitin were supposed to have. After defeating Chitin, Priodubia decides it's time for them to finish off Krill themselves. Priodubia decides to just start shooting umami blasts at you, and you don't really have to do anything but dodge. Or if you discover a game-breaking bug like I did, which made the game a whole lot easier, then hiding underneath the shell will do. Basically, she will slowly deplete her HP as the fight goes on and all you need to do is not die. Priodubia fades away and you now have the chance to put on the perfect world. But hey, the world is imperfect and in comes our boy Firth. Firth says that the shell is calling him and he feels a strange connection to it. Firth goes on with his super villain monologue while Krill is pleading to let him use the perfect world to heal Chitin. But no. Firth decides, hey, I'm a young hermit crab who wants to get some stocks myself and not let fish decide it for me. Firth then uses the perfect world to bring the entirety of Trash Island on top of New Crescinia. In my opinion, it does kind of give off some syndrome energy where if everybody has trash, then nobody has to struggle anymore type of shit. It does sound like Firth is pitching to Shark Tank, but he's just going to make it happen anyways. I really need that shell! Kitan's hurt bad! I'll tell you who's hurt bad. The economy. That's who. With Roland gone and Scuttle poured out of commission, our whole city's gonna completely collapse. And not only that, Folks are starting to say the trash we've been using is physically harmful to us. Who would have thought? But it's all gonna be okay. Now that I'm the god of this ocean, I've got a super genius three-step plan to save everyone. Step one, sink Trash Island onto New Carcinia, eliminating the whole concept of Trash Day. A permanent economic boom! What's better than that? You're going to cover this city in trash? Can we just talk about this? I just need to borrow the world for Step a minute! Step two, use that trash to usher new Carcinia into a second golden age. 
You'll see technology advance beyond your wildest dreams. You're not listening to me! And step three. With all that new tech, we'll form a plan to make new Carcinia's economy more sustainable. We ought to be able to start using 20% less trash within the next 200 tides or so. You thought I forgot about that part, didn't you? But I'm a caring guy. If you dump more trash on the reef, aren't they just gonna get gonked faster? And... and, and I still need to save Chitin! So give me that shell! I'm not going to let you do this! That's the cool part about being a god. I don't need you to let me do anything. It's just gonna happen. He then activates the world's power to start sinking the trash. You now have to fight Firth. I'm not gonna lie, Firth is a bitch to fight. He does a lot of damage and is annoying because he does taunt you a lot and uses moves that faint, teleport, and he even blocks. Basically, everything in your arsenal. Firth even creates a trash greatsword. I'd say his character is like the perfect foil to Krill's. Krill uses a fork while Firth uses a spoon. But wait, where's my third hermit crab that uses a knife? We need to have the utensil trio complete. But jokes aside, each of them have their own selfish goals. While Krill slowly learns to appreciate his newfound friendship with the residents of New Carcinia, Firth just maintains his stand on, I've got a million dollar idea, get trash, who cares if you get gunked as long as there's trash, and just wants to glorify himself. After defeating his first stage, you're shown a scene where the fight with Firth cracks the perfect world. He then uses his power to sprout tentacles, and I gotta tell you, his damage is insane. He can create water spouts, use attacks that have a mix of light and heavy windups, and now drops urchin-shaped explosive mines. It does scream final boss. It gives off a true JRPG final boss fight where you have to defeat a godlike being, except this one's Michael Reeves, who is a god in real life. After defeating Firth, Krill decides to embody Chitin's rage and try to give Firth an ass mech in using the world's power. I think I get what Chitin meant now. Krill, hold on. Let's talk about this like adults. If I'm gonna be angry, I might as well use it for something good. So that maybe, one day, other people won't have to fight like me. And what better way to start than to beat up a selfish, greedy, muscle, shocker, like... Yeah! Wait, 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 wait! However, the shell breaks and just launches both Firth and Krill to the bottom of the city. Krill then wakes up to the city covered in trash. Everyone rejoicing in the miracle that happened to them and that everyone is rich now. You also see Firth and he gets the boot, literally. You then get back to Pranathan and try to have him give back your shell, but he just outright says he's rich and only talk to him if you got something he needs. You then get a prompt to attack Pranathan and yes, you get your shell back. But finally, we then get another video about how the Earth's creatures are resilient and how the world is slowly heading towards its end. I absolutely appreciate the message the game sends us and this is an actual reality check to how we are taking care of our own oceans. We see real life trash islands, animals stuck to plastic cup holders, crabs holding on to trash they see on the ocean floor, crabs with knives. We then get to see Krill do things post the trash island incident. From saving Chitin to helping other crustaceans from gunked up sea creatures to Krill donating his shell to the homeless hermit crab in New Carcinia. Showing that our little hermit crab who just wanted to stay in his tide pool and live inside his shell has now shed it and is there to be the new hero New Carcinia needs. A hero who protects his new home. Woo! The game story is just absolutely fun to talk about. But now let's talk about something more enjoyable. The combat. If there's a thing that I like about Souls-like games, it's weighted combat. This leads you to be careful on how to attack and not just attack like a brainless barbarian raging. You can feel that the attacks are supposed to hurt. As a player who likes both Monster Hunter and Souls-like games alike, this feels like a treat. The game also offers a taste of variety as each shell you can find in the game offers unique powers. I understand that devs would need to have some repeat abilities or some shells that are duds and don't do anything at all. My playthrough was absolutely fun, even though it was tough and challenging, because learning which shell works best for your playstyle is totally refreshing. Finding the perfect loadout that works for you gives the game a personal touch for each player. One gripe I have though is how the camera can betray you in certain fights. 
the lock-on mechanic doesn't really work for me as I prefer being able to check my surroundings instead of just focusing on one thing. The game-breaking bug I found though is that the thimble is absolutely broken. The thimble is only supposed to make your shell invincible to the next three attacks you take. However, I had an actual invulnerable shell that didn't break no matter how many times I got hit while blocking. I'd say it does seem like a cheese strat in a Souls-like game, but hey, you gotta finish the story somehow. Oh yeah, if you didn't know, you can adjust the settings in the game as well. If you're feeling a little bothered by the difficulty, you can even give Krill a gun. It one-shots everything. You can even one-tap Firth. The god of the ocean, my ass. Another crab's treasure boasts a skill tree which offers more unique abilities to use. From being able to pick up trash and use it as a hammer to adding another dodge while mid-air. Being able to pull your enemies towards you and even parrying. Speaking of unique abilities, you gain these from fighting with bosses. Some will have them, some won't. As a hermit crab, you have the capability of using the power of umami and get adaptations. From shooting pistol bubbles to summoning a giant crab claw that deals damage and debuffs your enemies, the abilities you can get can be upgraded. However, upgrading is not required to finish the game. Speaking of not required to finish the game, there are optional bosses scattered around the ocean or the overworld. You don't really need to fight these guys at all, but they are a challenge if you want 100% the game. I spent nearly half an hour trying to beat the first optional boss I saw. I am a hard-headed player and I want to beat things even though I'm not supposed to beat them at that point in time. One important NPC is Topoda, the Grove Garden. Topoda is an optional boss fight and will reward you with an adaptation if you defeat him. However, you can actually finish the game without even encountering him, but that also locks away the capability of upgrading any adaptations you get through your playthrough. A personal favorite of mine has to be the Consortium. It's giving grotesque body horror type of design. After defeating the boss, you then get to see all of the wildlife trapped inside that cage swim freely back to where they belong. Enemy design is another thing I appreciate about the game. You can tell that the devs spent giving themes to these enemies, and they chose wisely. I love the Japanese-inspired archer crabs. The scuttling sludge steamroller looks like a Roman soldier, and the polluted platoon pathfinder? Its design sort of reminds me of a samurai with a capital helmet, or the royal shell splitter, just looking like a scary executioner. These designs are well thought out. Before I forget, the sound design is wild. I like the attention to detail. Whenever you get to walk on surfaces that are glass and you can hear that slight tink or metal and even the atmospheric vibe the Unfathom gives is truly an immersive experience. If you didn't know and haven't seen my last video, I mentioned that the game's soundtrack is an easy way to get me hooked. The music in Another Crab's Treasure is great. Every time a boss fight happens, they play an upbeat battle theme and then the next thing you know, you're just chilling to the great tunes in the bottom of New Carcinia. The ending theme is just a huge chef's kiss and just makes me want to love the game some more. Every song in the game just evokes those emotions it needs to hit. I swear some of these are lo-fi tracks you can crap out to, and that just makes it even more adorable. Another thing I like about the game is that it's filled with pop culture references and it's filled with jokes. You can tell that the devs spend time thinking of fun ways to incorporate meme culture in another crab's treasure. From costumes like Cult of the Lamb to Mr. Krabs or the Red Crewmate, the imposter guy from Among Us, to the frickin' F key as your shell. Press F fam for all the sea life that died while you tried to complete this game. From a cigarette pack that clearly looks like the Marlboro logo to being able to use the shelter that bites on Slowpoke's tail, to a fish driving a car which totally looks like the car from Toy Story, or having your weapon upgraded by a crab that totally looks like Kamaji from Spirited Away. Those are so many totallys. To using your fishing line and hook onto places a la Sekiro, you can't have a crab game without referencing Crab Rave as well. The references are everywhere and all you have to do is look. Let's end this on a high claw. I mean, high note. Another Crab's Treasure is an indie gem you need to play. It's a Souls-like adventure made with pure love by devs for the genre and it is an absolute banger. I definitely got hooked, no pun intended. Agro Crab literally went in and made an indie game that is loved by its community. Speedruns are even happening. One thing's for sure, if you ever play this game, you are going to love it. Remember, evolution is inevitable and everything becomes crab eventually. This has been your boy Android Paw, and thank you so much for watching. If you can leave a like or a comment, that would be appreciated. Or you can even subscribe so I know you guys enjoy my content. I appreciate you staying for this long and taking your time to watch the video. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.